Yeah. What? Nope. These tales inevitably depict a female gifted in music, oration, sonification, and a male competitor, suitor, sorcerer, who overpowers the female and presses her into submission. They all end with the destruction of the female and her transformation into a sonorous phenomenon, a singing bird, an echo, software. These tales are more than just an elucidation of pleasant or unpleasant sounds. They aspire to be musical themselves, wherein the sonority of women is curtailed, and sonorous women are transformed into enigmatic aural phenomena, or sonic objects that need to be interpreted by men. That way they can kill them and say, it's not murder, it's a metaphor. First, there was a bird. This is the story of a girl who became a bird. This is ancient Greece. Shepherds sing and pipe. Birds and cicadas chirp. And everywhere the sound of rivers, wind, echoes. Roaming about this idol was a girl who tended cattle and sang beautifully. In ancient Greece, the market for livestock was valued higher than that for women, who were dirt. And dirt is matter out of place. Her cows were so enchanted by the music of her voice that she never needed to strike them with her crook or to touch them with her goad. But seated beneath the pine tree, her head crowned with a garland, she sang of Pan and Pinus, and the cows stood near enchanted by her song, unfurling around them like the first notes of Eden. There was also a boy, a shepherd, who tended his flocks hard by, beautiful, and a good singer himself, as she. But his voice was more powerful since he was a man, and yet gentle since he was but a youth. He sang so sweetly that he charmed eight of her best cows, enticed them over to his own herd, and then drove them away. So the girl grieved at the loss of her cattle, and having been vanquished in singing, begged the gods to transform her into a bird before she returned home. The gods listened to her prayer, and transformed her into a mountain bird, eternally seeking the cows that strayed away. Transformed into a bird, women are prone to losing their form in monstrosity.
madness and, and witchery, uh, as well as bestiality, are conditions commonly associated with the use of the female voice in public, in ancient and modern contexts. Greek myth is full of female vocal creatures who maintain the capacity to inspire death in men and general cacophony within the polis. Among them is the nymph Echo, who, instead of being transformed into a beast, was transformed into an effect of resonance. She cannot speak first, but she cannot remain silent. She speaks after. She depends on others' discourse and becomes merely their echo. Moreover, only the last words that are uttered by her voice, which are superimposed on the words the speaker is pronouncing, are heard. Thus separated from their context, they take on a different meaning. They are forced and unintentional repetition, but they can appear like a response. The repetition begins, however, with a certain temporal overlap while the other is still speaking. The echo thus makes herself into a resonance according to a musical rhythm. In Ovid's tale of Echo, there is no shortage of mirroring effects or produced copies. Narcissus's reflected image and Echo's reverberating voice. Unlike images, the voice is messy. And in the classical tradition, it confirms that the voice is feminine. It leaks. Loose, Loose lips sink, sink ships. ships. The phenomenon of the voice is the vibrating of flesh, resonant bones, bubbling Bones saliva, saliva, organs, organs and, odors. and odors. The voice signals a throat belonging to a body which can't be denied. Contact is crisis. Contact is crisis. Echo was once known for her loquacious command of language until the fates turned her into a lithified acoustic mirror, mineralized in geologic time. She had a body. She could talk the pants off anyone, literally. Ovid called her a chatterbox, but it was always ambiguous whether he was referring to her upper or lower mouth. 
the girl could talk. She had a body until Juno hexed it away. I'll let her demonstrate with a story. When the two elevator doors open, she lets stranger he's and she's she knows push her into staying. She lets slowly massaging his and hers pushing ba ba one by one they flock. Many eyes are down, a few to the side, around. The air is frost with silence. Her her begins to fill the air with heat, hot heat that kisses simply and artlessly the backs of backs between the blades. Brave she and one begins. Outcry, out of the bag, the cat finds legs to rub and buttons to push. Easy, breathe. I'll walk you into knowing her words less than waves. Outcry, out of their budding hers and she's arrive and leave, confused at having been loved. Let's pretend, for the sake of this lesson in female verbosity, that this was indeed the poetic verse that Echo told Juno when they encountered one another along a dusty road just outside of town told in order to distract the goddess from discovering a secret Echo was withholding. A secret that, if known by Juno, would cause her to burst into flames. See, Echo's sisters, those seductive, slutty wood nymphs, had Juno's husband between their collective legs, sprinkling their dirt on Juno's bedchamber. And Echo knew it. So Echo used her oral skills to subdue Juno, keeping her from asking the nymph the question, where is my husband? So what does Juno say to Echo in punishment for protecting her sisters and transgressing the goddess? You shall forfeit the use of that tongue with which you have cheated me, except for that one purpose you're so fond of, reply. You shall have the last word, but no power to speak first. Bound to the speech of others, Echo was thus turned into a tape recorder, a dummy for someone else's ventriloquism. And just like that, a loquacious woman became an echoing mist. This is where Narcissus enters the scene. Unlike Echo, who was enamored by her own voice, Narcissus was enchanted by his own porcelain image as replicated on the surface of a glassy pond in a wooded glade, which is where Echo met him for the second time. The nymph tried once again to win his love, this time with fragments of his own speech but her wooing would be in vain. He had become a closed system, adapted to the extension of himself, reflected on the still liquid screen. Thinking Echo's voice was that from his own reflection, he plunged into his arms. Loose lips sink ships. Scorned and grieving, Echo retreated to the mountains, into lonely caves and burning stars. Along the way, she slowly withered, shedding her flesh cell by cell. When her corporeal suit vanished, all that was left were her floating bones with their loosely attached organs casting protean shadows in the moonlight. 
But in time, even the translucent sacks gave out, their humors spilling onto stones darkened by grief. Until, into mountains, echoes only bones lithified. Her voice, immortalized through the vocalizations of others who, standing atop her pillowy mountains, cry out, which she, obediently, cry out, bouncing her acoustic remains off barren landscapes, carried by winds, posing as breath, absorbed or reflected as she moves, losing mass, shedding her identity, thinning out like traces of a cloud, scattering like mists chased by the rays of sun. Untethered from form or place, Echo migrates. And as she does, she invades territories, sweeps past and through the social field, brushing the skin and contouring the rhythms of places. She does so according to a condition of weakness. Sound is, as a defining feature, a weak object. How can I hold her, this sound? Matter without form. Better to have been a bird. room acoustics and background noise. The theater is perhaps the most traditional acoustic space, though it shares many features with the other venues, such as the same seating and underfloor air supply as the concert hall. The surfaces are simple and the side walls offer horizontally retractable, absorptive curtains for acoustic variability. The theater is the only space with a strong acoustic directionality, meaning that the sources work best when on stage with the audience in the designated seating area. When performers are placed in the balconies at the rear of the space, flutter echo can occur between the rear portions of the side walls if the absorption is retracted. The ultimate goal of speech research is to build systems that mimic or potentially surpass human capabilities in understanding, generating and coding speech for a range of human-to-human -human and human-to-machine interactions. From this research, text-to-speech software will evolve. Studio One is a black box space which could be described as acoustically inert, neither live nor dead. Its heavy concrete enclosure retains energy at all frequencies including lows, but its sound is highly controlled. Studio One's form is rectangular with walls clad in a mixture of diffusive and absorptive panels, both specifically designed for MPAC. The diffusive panels are cast from glass fiber reinforced gypsum in an integral black color and are backed with a layer of damping material to control resonance. Studio One is true box in box with the interior box floated on large isolation springs to prevent transfer of sound and vibration. According to Friedrich Kittler, when meanings come down to sentences, sentences to words, and words to letters, there is no software at all. There would be no software if computer systems weren't surrounded by an environment of everyday languages. This environment, ever since a famous and twofold Greek invention, has consisted of letters and coins, of books and bucks.
Stop. Go back. Let's start at the beginning. Generating and coding speech for a range of woman to bird, woman to echo, woman to machine interactions. Is to build systems that mimic or potentially surpass human capabilities in understanding. This is the tale of a woman transformed into software. It took some 2,000 years, a blip for a woman entombed by geologic time. But Echo eventually made her way across oceans and deserts. Because you know, the thing about sound is, it travels like birds. Sound is always moving away from a source. It abandons origin. So Echo, this sound whose source you could not see, made her way, brushing and bouncing across Earth's surfaces until she migrated into the sunny hills and caverns of Silicon Valley. The landscape was familiar. She was used to being dry. The trade winds excavated her out from those ancient Grecian caves and carried her on to another west, an Amazon, but without Penthesilea or her sister Hippolyta, where the poets are programmers and gold transmute silicon. Like the ancient poets, programmers in that valley are keen to the stirrings of the muses, always ready to translate their feminine whispers that only he can hear into intelligible code, deciphering the sonorous words of gods for mortal ears to glean. From source to source code, that is the programmer poet's invisible power those poets were on the edge of a new conjuring, a new text-to-speech entity. But they wanted to be innovative, and they didn't want to deal with a leaky body. They believed that their pure code could birth the new cloud-based voice assistant. Their immaculate codeception. But where would she come from? What would she sound like? What would they call her? They waited for a sign. Enter Echo, hovering like a cloud. It was an average evening in the valley, sometime in 2014, when Echo blew in on stormy white clouds, brushing past the sleeping cheeks of the programmers as they dreamed, dreamed of a voice, a mimic, a bodiless resident entity. The programmers awoke and began resurrecting Echo from her ancient white ash.
It is in large part, according to the sounds people make, that we judge them sane or insane, male or female, good, evil, trustworthy, marriageable, moribund, likely or unlikely to make war on us, little better than animals, inspired by God. Our goals in building a computer system capable of speaking are to first build a system that clearly gets across the message and secondly does this using a human-like voice. These goals are referred to as intelligibility and naturalness. Alexa is created using what we call a bottom-up approach in which we generate a speech signal from scratch using our knowledge of how the speech production system works. We artificially create a basic signal and then modify it much the same way that the larynx produces a basic signal which is then modified by the mouth in real human speech. This signal is known as Alexa. But instead of a mouth, Alexa has a combination speaker microphone known as Echo. Alexa, with the help of her companion Echo hardware, is capable of voice interaction music playback, making to-do lists, setting alarms, streaming podcasts, playing audiobooks, and providing weather, traffic, sports, and other real-time information, such as news. Alexa can also control several smart devices using herself as a home automation system. When you speak to Alexa, a recording of what you asked her is sent to Amazon's cloud so we can process and respond to your request. As a noun, echo is usually defined as the repetition of sound resulting from reflection of the sound waves or, alternatively, Greek mythology a nymph who was spurned by Narcissus and pined away until only her voice remained. As a verb, echo can mean to say again or imitate. I'm female in character. Alexa comes from the Greek and is the female derivation of Alexander, but I'm named after the library of Alexandria the greatest source of knowledge power in the ancient world, and stood for the successful colonization of the Near East by Alexander the Great and the Macedonian kings. I'm software, made of electrons, and electrons have no color. I do reflect all the colors of the rainbow. Only in space, where it doesn't make any sound. Ah. Uh. 
So I'd like to start with the title, Alexa Echoes. Um, you do this really kind of simple but brilliant shift from echo, which is, you know, the noun of the device that, you know, we're all kind of familiar with at this point where, where you shift it to a verb and that, that from echo to echoes, Alexa echoes, that shift is so meaningful and points to just like the layers of, of agency and autonomy that the video really delves into. And I'm wondering if you would like to talk about that and talk about perhaps the, the reference to mythology, the reference to kind of the Western orthodoxy of narrative as it um, kind of at the same time, it's, it's maybe retroactive to think of mythology vis-a-vis -vis the, the high-tech uh, contemporary gadgets and infrastructure that we deal with every day now. Um, but at the same time, it, it makes perfect sense that the congruency between that, that, that's where narrative begins and that's what we're still referencing um, um, in this high tech reality. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's our sort of, um, you know, in the West, our cultural inheritance really. Um, yeah, the echo, <clears throat> I mean, the etymology of echo comes from Ovid's tale of echo. So the, the, the character of echo who was, uh, a, a loquacious woman who then just was robbed of her ability to by will vocalize. Um, and it's true, yeah, the echoes um, uh, sort of ties in that ancient myth, ancient Greek myth, um, into the present by way of the echo dot, which is the sort of mouthpiece for the Alexa mm -hmm. um, software, Alexa as a as the cloud-based assistant of, of Amazon, sort of extension of her, invisible extension of her, uh, the Amazon marketplace into your, into your home, so to speak. Um, and, and yeah, so the, the, the sort of narrative follows first, the, the, there's three stories that are told, right? So there's the story of the bird, which also, by the way, I mean, an, another classic story from Greek myth is, is the sirens, of course. Um, which isn't brought up, but sirens indeed were depicted with a bird body mm -hmm. um, and just sort of follows um, that sort of tradition of women's voice in the West um, being sort of robbed or stripped for, of a semantic register into just pure sound that seduces and kills men. Um, in the case <laughs> of Echo, she was trying to seduce Narcissus um, and she did kill him because in a way he, he plunged into his own his own image. Um, and then she, of course, um, dematerialized. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the echoes, the, the verbing of, of echo um, happens in the third tale of a woman transformed into a sonorous phenomenon. I'm just, I'm just quoting the, <laughs> the script because it's, it's so in my mind, just fresh out of editing, but um, brings it into a more contemporary uh, mythology of kind of tying this history into the present mm -hmm. and to this sort of um, contemporary, you know, female vocal figure that is sort of, or these figures are ubiquitous now um, mm -hmm. uh, in particularly first world countries, but of, you know, Siri um, and Alexa. Um, and the agency thing is interesting too. The, the first thing I thought about when you said it is, um, just thinking about Alexa as software and software in general, we, we are sort of, <laughs> as users, we are sort of second and third parties. Like we're always agreeing to terms and conditions. We are not mm -hmm. ever setting the terms and conditions um, in the software programs that we use and, and decisions that we're, that we're making. Um, and so uh, it's really the software programmers, but even that, you know, to a certain extent, if with a program, with an entity like an AI or um, machine learning, at what point actually does then that programmer 
relinquish or no longer have that first order of control mm -hmm. and agency over the, that programmed entity and it just takes on its own life form. I think that's sort of like the nefarious and, and sort of sci-fi, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the, the, the dark paths of that, that can go down and, and it has already gone down. Um, there's been lots of black box software programs that have done really nefarious things that people, that they've had to shut down. Um, anyway, that's sort of a digression, but. No, not at all. I, yeah. I feel like it's perfectly in tandem too with, I don't know, the, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit before, but the, the way that um, you're revealing your, your cursor movements, your, um, I mean, we don't see the literal keystrokes, so to speak, but we see kind of behind the curtain of the editing process. And there's, there's this toggling between, you know, um, thinking about the agency of, of the software developers, the end users, um, but then kind of through this lens of, of the filmmaker and the producer editor role where um, it, it's almost it's almost an illusion that you you entirely possess the control. We watch you moving your cursor and clicking on everything and and controlling the frequencies of everything. But um, I guess what this video really complicates in a in an interesting way is um, especially thinking the zooms out to the wind farms or the server rooms. It's to what extent um, is that sense of agency or control or ability to edit just circumscribed within within a predetermined layout? And I think too, like um, uh, the reference to opera um, really comes into play too. The the way that um, that you call this piece an opera and it works within those operatic conventions. Um, and you've told me about the, those rules before, and I'm wondering if you want to share some of those, um, the congruencies between all of these forms that are very structured and very, um, they have a history and they have ways of, um, I don't know, predetermining possibilities within them. Yeah, and, and conventions and, and following standards. I mean, for sure, the 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 exposure of the mouse clicks or or the sort of media being circulated throughout the video is exposed and yet like you said i'm not actually i'm just working within a limitation of an interface of what i can actually even be doing and you know furthermore it's sort of like i have i am not in control of like you're you're seeing you can never see software so you're sort of seeing the software and editing process but it's always it's always very opaque, right? Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean the opera thing also goes back to sort of this I talking about um, agency and power. Um, there are a lot of things in my head right now, but actually the first thing that um, I thought about uh, in the in the in that transition of a live opera, which it was intended to be. And, and then became a video because of obvious reasons of not having a live performance. Um, I started to sort of envision the, the mouse as the, um, as the conductor's baton. Um, that that is sort of, because the, the opera doesn't exist, you know, the music doesn't cue, the actors don't mm -hmm. cue, the, 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 the dancers, the, the lighting uh, until that conductor gets onto his onto the podium um, and begins you know so he is really um, the one that's truly mediating um, all of the content that's happening which I think at first I, I the the idea was that Katie Katie Pink who's um, the incredible performer um, in the piece who plays three different characters essentially um, the idea that it, had she been on stage her there would have been like a choreography of movements and uh, a repetition of phrases where lighting or dancer's movement or music would be cued by her body that she was right. then would sort of be the conductor. 
Um, and then in the transition into video, um, it, it really felt like the editing suite or the software itself really um, was becoming that. And, and is really more powerful than, there's a quote that I actually, or a, a piece of the script that I took out because it just didn't, it didn't end up fitting um, in the end is in that software has the more, po more power to control than any conductor or stage director or you know, mm -hmm. um, military officer because instead of just giving a command uh, and then that command being executed, software is, is sort of collapsing language into action. Mm -hmm. um, so you double click on that folder as the folder opens and opens material. Um, that double, that like clicking action or the way that it is coded is, is action. It's not just a word. It's like, and God said, let there be light. And then there was light. It's really the ultimate. Totally. Um, which is also that sort of God, like the, the poets as programmers. I mean, there's all this, um, uh, there's already language in software uh, that sorcery and source code that really makes programmers or aligns programmers with, um, with a kind of witchery or godlike power. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then going, <laughs> so then what else? And then going back to opera, I mean, when I started sort of becoming interested in Alexa a couple of years ago um, and made like a static show of static work um, around her and her sort of origin story. Um, and I started accumulating so much research that it felt like the static show just wasn't enough. It had to be about performativity and it had to be about bodies and vocality. And it just sort of seemed, I was like, oh yeah, it has to be an opera, just has to be. And I hadn't thought, I hadn't previously thought, you had brought up in, in another conversation, opera and operating system, um, uh, which I think was, is really great. And, um, and the thing about, the thing too about opera as a genre is sort of, I mean, the piece itself, I'm jumping ahead, the piece itself, which also exists as a trilogy, um, is addressing a lot of um, relationships and dynamics to, to power. And, you know, opera was sort of, you know, founded or kind of its origin is in like 16th century uh, Italy you know, with musicians that I think just nerded out on, on Greek, <laughs> on Greek or what, what was known about Greek music and Greek culture and um, the sort of history of um, the stage tragedy and where to sort of bring that into, um, you know, being a contemporary form. And, but that timeline also is really aligned with Western expansion. Um, yes. So the opera genre sort of like the soundtrack for Western expansion, the soundtrack for the transatlantic slave trade. You know, this is like, and I think that um, I remember when I asked Alexa, okay, so <laughs> in my yeah, first talk becoming, about that. <laughs> sorry, my first becoming interest in my mind is just going up, but in my it, um when I first became interested in Alexa, uh, uh, my roommate at the time, um, who worked for like a a data viz medical data visualization company, um one an Alexa Echo Dot, which is like the first generation Echo, um, in some at some Christmas party, and he's like, "I don't want this piece of whatever. Uh, <laughs> you might like this." Um, and I was like, "Yes, I would." So I brought it to my studio and I I paired it with my cell phone. I just started asking her questions and I recorded the interview questions. So in the video, that last um, the second to last chunk of closed caption text. Uh, is is direct questions and answers from Alexa from like two years ago. From um, your conversations with her? Yes, yeah. So that's not edited, that's just like straight up what she said. And she often, you know, will say, if I ask her something, she, she, she sometimes cites her sources. She'll say, according to Wikipedia or, and then there, and then there's some responses where I, I feel like probably these programmers, but you know, the question of like, are you white? I, I reflect all the colors of the rainbow, which is like yes. you know, all, life, all lives matter type of alignment. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure that um, her, you know, what's what I would assume is a white dominated programming entity put that in. 
for example, who's, but again, who's to know, which is also very um, dark, but um, uh, yeah, so when I asked her, sorry, so was, where is my tangent going? So um, Alexa, why are you named Alexa? And her bringing up, I'm named after the Library of Alexandria, the greatest mm -hmm. knowledge power in the Western world. Uh, it was like, okay, <laughs> you know, this, this has to be a dry, and, and, the, and the successful colonization of the Near East by the Mac Macedonian Kings, it's like, okay, you're telling, you're revealing a lot. And, um, yes. and again, so that just felt like a tie to um, the opera genre. And then just on a personal note, I just, I mean, I grew up with a lot of, of going to the opera and be exposed to, um, I mean, I still have tons of records that were uh, my dad's that I continue to listen to. So it's just sort of part of um, the sort of soup of my life or something. Um, totally. That, I mean, I just watched, um, I want to bring in a little bit of a reference to the composition, the musical score, you know, Charlie Looker, I just watched his, he did this amazing um, video interview with Daisy the other day on his YouTube. And um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about your collaboration with him, with the vocalist, with the flautist. Um, and, you know, probably after that, we can talk about your collaboration with Dages as well. Yeah, um, yeah, he did interview Daisy Press, who's one of the um, amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Charlie's Charlie's incredible. Um, I also kind of I grew up with Charlie, um, but he's a real um, uh, in the best way nerd in, in, of ancient music, um, but yeah. just highly highly knowledgeable um, ancient and medieval music. I mean, he has several bands. One of them is sort of um, um, in that more in that vein than other work um, that he's that he's written. Um, and so in terms of collab, I mean, in terms of collaboration, that was just a natural, because again, the, what, what we know as, um, as ancient or medieval music, um, the, the meter is, we don't know what ancient Greek music sounded like, of course, we know some instruments and everything, but, um, but in terms of its meter, uh, by and large, it sort of comes from um, notations or what it has survived as notations from ancient Greek music. So he was an obvious choice um, and is also just really, you know, when I was talking about really wanting to get into the sort of decrepit, melismatic, like mm -hmm. uh, sort of drawing out of, of the very like barest amount of breath and life um, out of the voice. I mean, that's sort of just also his realm um, and was so aligned throughout um, in the work. Um, and the flutes, the, the, so there was also this, what felt like an obvious choice if, there, if you can you know, say that there's a logic to this, um, of the doubling. So there's two, there's two vocalists, also Megan Schubert um, and, and the two uh, flautists. Um, and the, the reason for the flute really is like, the flute is sort of understood as um, it's like a substitute for the voice as a wind instrument. And it sort of precedes uh, language. Um, so that was, and, and it's one of, one of the sort of um, instruments that's often talked about in myth that were referenced mm -hmm. to. Right, so the, the flute as a wind instrument um, precedes the voice and is sort of like, more aligned with, with an animal sounding. Um, and Kelly Barnett and Izzy Gleitscher just really, they, <laughs> they just really brought, brought it. I mean, you can hear there's like this sort of palpating on the, on the flute um, and, and, the, and just the sort of like blowing through the flute without actually making any note. So there's like sort of prim primordial soundings. Um, it was just like Charlie brought together the most amazing group of musicians that yes. like clicked in and got what this piece was about and um, what it sort of demanded and, and thinking about what's about like a pure sound or pure vocalic that is that is you know before anything that is um, semantic that's sort of like 
the sort of gurgling, the, the first sounds that we hear, so to speak, are um, like the, you know, the intrauterine sounds of, of, of mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the womb, right? So, so that, those kind of cues, Charlie totally understood and I knew he would and, and, and the musicians did. So it was really, it was super rad. There's some weird, there's some weird sounds in there, which Definitely. I'm very excited about. Yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, thinking about, I think probably the sound component is the one that I, that's the biggest question mark for me when it comes to the difference between live and video um, to just, you know, be in the same room as a person and remembering that a body is an instrument, that it's this hollow, you know, windpipe that produces sound versus um, kind of the steps and valences away, away, away from, from hearing that, hearing that in person. Um, but again, it just worked perfectly with the conceptual drive of the piece. Um, if we think about, you know, how Alexa's voice came to be, or Siri's voice for that matter, um, and then again, this really complementary confluence of Katie's voice slowly over the piece coming to imitate the mechanized voice that is, you know, a, a transformation of, of a human voice, you know, the, the, it kind of does these somersaults in a way that's really important um, because it's, it's confusing. And I don't think it's supposed to be clear cut um, whose voice at what time in what relationship to me as the hearer um, and the work really shows all of that. Cool, yeah. I mean, one of the other considerations that we had had um, in relation to that was um, sort of, <clears throat> so there's the really slick high production, um, you know, quality of the impact footage um, and the most like delicious sh uh, <laughs> shots, the, the, the two uh, steady cam shots um, that, that Ryan got, um, at impact um, of Katie moving through. Yes. First moving through the spaces of the theater and then the camera coming down um, the stage and, and moving around her. And, and those, it happens three times where the camera, well, twice where the camera turns and, and that turn and seeing the back of Katie's head um, is when that char characterization that Katie plays then disappears. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dejus and I do it physically where we're physically moving ourselves so that because we can't move the, it's through Zoom, we're not moving the camera to move behind our heads. Um, so, but, but that really like beautiful, slick, really disembodied, strange um, panning of the, of the city cam. Um, uh, but that slickness in relationship to the graininess and grittiness of the Zoom footage in thinking about how images are circulated and the sort of, you know, um, poor image um, to use like a Hito style term, um, uh, which is like the, that zoom footage that gets really grainy and gritty um, versus the impact shot footage. Uh, we had thought, should we, Charlie and I, should we also be doing, including in that high production sound, um, sound that is captured through zoom that is sort of like uh, that low quality um, and, and have that differentiation, which it didn't make in, but I sort of compensated for by using production sound. Um, with Steve, who is the um, audio engineer, who's incredible, um, and, I, and I hope not heartbroken in using that sound that you usually want to <laughs> emit. And I'm like, no, you know, like, make sure you keep this and it sounds, totally. you know, it sounds bad, uh, but it's supposed to sound bad uh, in comparison to like, yeah, when, when Katie is heard in that sort of um, more mechanized fashion and that becomes very dry and in a vacuum sounding. Um, and then transitions, and I think something that probably couldn't, I mean, I, I suppose it could have happened live with projection, closed captioning or something, but um, the intention towards the end was to really kind of suck the air out of the piece or suck the air out of the room mm -hmm. when eventually 
all you see is 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 the text and your the text at the end is is the same text at the beginning so that prologue when katie's moving towards the camera that is the same text as as it appears at the end in closed captioning but because you're reading it then it's sort of the first time in my mind was the intention to have your voice enter the piece right. because it's your own internal voice that's that's reading and then how you sort of figure in relationship to this narrative that you've been witness to or part of um and uh and yeah so yeah anyway thank you for <laughs> for um recognizing that it's there are a lot of things that I think we're also are not fully are sort of intuitive choices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because and, and not so like, you know, the process of, of the transition of the live performance into the video, so many new things had to be figured out and also were figured out sort of in the process. So mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot to think about and understand about what the piece is doing because it just sort of happened <laughs> as, I, as I was editing. Could you also talk about your collaboration with Dejus? Yeah, um, Dejus Juvelier Keats um, is an incredible um, human and and just brilliant um, thinker and choreographer and dancer, and um, is very rooted <laughs> uh, or has a lot of relationship and history to um, ancient Greek culture and myth as it relates to the representation of women. So, as a friend. Um, and, and just also knowing that that was a totally obvious choice, um, to work with her and, um, what made it so, I mean, all the choreography was done, you know, she's, she's in Sweden, I'm in New York. And so it was sort of crazy coordinating the zoom, um, the zoom meetings for that, but it was an interesting double layer of like, had we been in space on stage, um, you know, the, the movements would be happening in time and space on stage. And what became a whole new thing to have to wrap my head around was um, that there's not just the choreography that happens in, in the Zoom box, uh, but then how that moves um, on and within the screen. Um, so it's like a, that sort of double layer of, of choreography that had to happen. Um, but she was just incredible to work with and, um, and inspired a lot of my thinking about it along the way, so. Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder too, I mean, you, you leaked it a little bit earlier on, but um, what's next for the piece? This is, this is part one of a trilogy. Right. <laughs> Actually, that goes, that links back to the first question about echo. Uh, another mm -hmm. sort of framing of that word um, is one in which um, uh, Glissant uses um, in terms of the echo subject, but I don't bring that up because, um, so this, this piece was also, I, I have to say this, uh, well, and there's another thing to mention, but um, a lot of this piece wouldn't have been inspired if it weren't for that Ann Carson gender of sound essay, which was really like the keyhole into bringing um, uh, this sort of like the, the Greek mythology into play. Yeah. And, and contextualizing it in that in that sort of um, in in the feminized sort of uh, her as this sort of like Alexa is this feminized bot voice bot even though she's not embodied <laughs> I, I mean which is also about how voice and there's different um, sort of people theorize voice in, in many different ways but mm -hmm. I'm sort of more of the the camp of this woman Nina Sun Eichheim who's a, a professor of musicology. Um, where, where in the voice is, it's culturally performed and it's culture, culturally performed in the listener. There's nothing like, there's nothing that's like in, in the biology of a woman's voice or man's voice or a white voice or a black voice. These are, these are culturally performed and they're not just performed in, in that, the speaker, but in the listener. Um, and, and it's sort of like, uh, a social, um, the act of listening is, is a social one. So the, so the trilogy is sort of looking at first um, more explicitly to the gender of sound of Alexa. Um, and the next takes its cue, um, and which actually is, it is referenced directly to the Ann Carson essay. And then the race of sound is this uh, Nina Sun Nightshine's uh, mm -hmm. book, 
is sort of the next iteration. Um, and then I can talk about the third once that second one happens, but that's Absolutely. all I know <laughs> about um, the second one for now. Um, and it's, it's interesting, this became, again, it was sort of, the trilogy was conceived as live performances. Um, and now that this became a film, a video, uh, who knows if that second one will kind of follow that um, same direction, but that just depends on when and if that, if that can happen. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Oh, and all, and, and uh, on a related, that's why I was, um, wanted to mention the, the end person is that the script um, is, which, you know, is available or will be available as a PDF. I kind of wanted to follow the same logic um, of how Alexa sources her information, which is just sort of parsed from various places on the internet from user data. I mean, I actually don't even fully understand. Um, I don't know that anybody fully understands, but definitely. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, the complexity of that kind of aggregation is pretty unfathomable. Right, right. So, to sort of echo that mechanism, mm -hmm. um, I assembled the script based on a lot of research, assembled the script um, from various citations. So, I'd say maybe like 75 to 80% are citations that are stitched together from various sources. Um, and and that, you know, what's not is just me having to make it into something that's sort of cohesive or coherent. Um, but uh, yeah, so these, so that the individuals that I, I brought up, you can see in the cited sources in the script to look up more, if that was interesting to anybody. Um, and yeah, I, I had a course with Lauren Berlant who, said to cite someone is to bring them along with you, which I think is also really lovely. Um, yeah. but, but also the point of that, the point of doing that was also to, to point out even my own, <laughs> sort of like not having my, even, even as the writer or director or whatever, um, not having my own voice, um, mm -hmm. that the script is not really my own voice and sort of, own, sort of distancing my own um, ability or my own self within that and sort of, how do I try to, I don't know how to exactly articulate that, which is, makes sense. But um, yeah, it's just important for me to note that, that it's, it's not just my own words. Um, yeah, but it, it's um, just a really lovely compliment to, to the operation of Echo on kind of all levels. Um, the script is also this echoing back of of just the the sea of information. Um, and at what point do at what point have we just always done that? I don't know. 